The man famous for catching predators on TV now caught bouncing checks. Meanwhile, a woman gets banned from Walmart for doing exactly what we wish we were doing at this very moment. And Lady Gaga and Angelina Jolie are both reportedly up for talks to play Cleopatra in a new movie. Oh yeah, we're going there today, but we're not going there quite so early because those three stories not quite top enough for top 10 status. So what stories per se you made it into the top 10 for this week? We'll get to those in just a bit here on the wrap-up show with me, Jay Cleveland Payne from ThisIsAConversation.com. This is the wrap-up show for the week ending January the 20th, 2019. And welcome to the show. My name is, as I've said, Jay Cliffin Payne, the host for the wrap up show and the man behind the things going on behind the scenes at this is a conversation.com. It's not a one man band, but it's, it's pretty close. There is some help out there, but I am the guy who sort of makes it run. And so I'll brag on that for a moment and I'll brag about the website. The website and this podcast is a project that allows you to get in touch with all the rest of the world, as many of us as possible and talk about what we really want to talk about, not just the big time conversation that is stuck on the chirons for the prime time mainstream news because we get stuck with a lot of trump because that's where we are here in the states and trump is kind of the big deal but there's lots of other stories stories that might be a little bit silly stories that might be a little bit serious but something you might have missed because it wasn't covered as openly and as boldly as the headlines that we see on headline news the process for this thing is very simple. We have social media feeds on Facebook and Twitter. TH underscore conversation for Twitter. And this is a conversation for Facebook. And just like regular social media, we post links to various sources to various stories throughout the day. Some of them are bigger. Some of them are kind of weird. But as they pop up in your feed throughout the day, we just ask you to do what you do to anything else. Good news, fake news or whatever. Like it, love it, hate it, share it. Reply to it, reply to me, do what you can with it, and the more engagement the stories get, the higher score they get. We put them together in a spreadsheet on the end of the week and tabulate things and come up with a ranking going from 1 to 10, so we give you those top 10 numbers. We also break down the next batch, which we call uh, 11 through 15, rounding out the almost rands, the stories that didn't quite make it into the top 10 list and maybe a little bit why. And, of course, we'll go to the very bottom of the list and talk about what we call the almost relevant story of the week. It's usually not so much irrelevant as in its really late posting. We post our stories and we pull our stories from Friday to Friday. So sometimes something posted very late Thursday, very early Friday, doesn't get a lot of love. Sometimes things posted very late Friday, very, very early Friday, very late Thursday, uh, blow up to the top of their big breaking news. It all depends on what's going on in the algorithms at the times. You can always send comments to me about the show or pretty much anything you want to at the conversation inbox at gmail.com. Quick bit to get into before we go to our housekeeping in the second segment of the day. Yes, no no guests today, so no interview. So there'll only be two segments. And there will be a super story explanation. It's a little bit off kilter, but the story was so important I want to make sure that it was covered and we had a chance to do that because a update was given later on in the day when we posted something on Friday. We'll talk about that. I'll let you know what it is and explain it when we get to the super story part. We'll get to the housekeeping part in segment two today. But right now, this is segment one, and let's get to the actual point of segment one, and that are the top ten stories for this week, as said per you. Headline in the ten spot this week might be a sign that a proud Kentucky man is giving up, but not so fast. Here is the headline for the number 10 story, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul is going to Canada for hernia surgery, posted on Monday, January the 14th. This is a few lines from the USA Today story where we pulled the actual copy from the story. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, one of the fiercest political critics of socialized medicine, will travel to Canada later this month to get hernia surgery. Paul, an ophthalmologist, said the operation is related to an injury sustained in 2017 when his neighbor, Rene Boucher, attacked him while he was mowing his lawn. The incident left a Kentucky junior senator with six broken ribs and a bruised lung. He is scheduled for the outpatient operation at the Shoulder Hernia Hospital in Thornhill, Ontario, during the week of January 21st, according to documents from Paul's civil lawsuit against Boucher filed in Warren Circuit Court. Seizures estimated cost anywhere from $5,000 to $8,000, according to the court documents. MD, MDSave.com, butchered that, lists a hernia repair costing between $4,000 and $8,000. There you go. 
Now, before you get all the tizzy about the good senator headed up north to get his socialized medicine, technically that's not happening. The hospital where he's having this done is probably owned, but they do accept the subsidized medicine plans that pretty much covers all of Canada. However, being that Rand Paul is not Canadian, he's a private person, he wouldn't qualify anyway. He's going to pay it basically out of cash, out of pocket cash charge, however he wants to do that. Maybe he'll write a check, who knows. But Rand Paul is paying for his surgery in Ontario, more or less because it's a good great place to have his surgery done, and it's convenient, not because he's a big fan of the socialized medicine, if you know what I mean. Story number nine is a sort of happy ending after a very weird and tragic story. The headline Jamie Kloss kidnapping suspect Jake Patterson charged with killing her parents. Friday, January 11th, the day we posted that one, but boosted response from the 10th story of 3.09%. Not going to spend a lot of time on this one because this one got really, really weird as the week went by. Uh, but we learned about Jamie Kloss, of course, has been missing for three months, was found wandering the streets when she was able to escape her captor uh, because it was kind of worked out. And the really, really strange stories goes to the fact that he saw the young lady, the girl, uh, someplace, decided he was going to kidnap her, made three attempts to kidnap her, uh, stole her father's shotgun, and that's what he killed her father with. And this, the story is just amazing that it happened, it went down like that, and the ending to it, the fact that she was able to escape, and now she is safe with relatives and hopefully on the way to something of a normal life will Normal will never be the same at this point. We got the copy in this listing from USA Today, so you can check it out on the website where we link to all the places we pulled our stories for. But we're not going to go deeper into this one, but we're just very happy that Jamie Kloss is home for whatever that's worth. And Jake Patterson, of course, is essentially going away for a long, long time. I'm not sure if I said it, but we had 212 different stories, 212 distinct postings this week, plus a couple of odd postings that I cross posted for some other projects. Sorry about that. But because we have so many extra postings and it's working very well, we're actually clipping some stories, and some stories get pushed back as breaking things come into the feed. This is one that took a little while to get out there, but once it got there, uh, trust me, you guys jumped all over it. You probably jumped all over it if you're there local. The eight story this week, tanker hauling 3,500 gallons of liquid chocolate it overturns on Arizona Highway Thursday, the 17th of January on that one. Bumpy response of 5% from the nine story. We'll read a few lines. We got this one from Fox 8 in Cleveland, oddly enough, because it was a nationalized story. A lot of people got onto it. Flagstaff, Arizona. A tanker full of liquid chocolate rolled over on an Arizona highway on Monday, causing it to spill out over the road, according to KNXV. The Arizona Department of Public Safety says the crash happened on Interstate 40 east of Flagstaff. The tanker was carrying 40,000 pounds of chocolate, about 3,500 gallons of liquid chocolate, that was being kept at 120 degrees Fahrenheit, DPS said in a tweet after reviewing the bill of lading. It was not immediately clear what caused the tanker to roll over. Now, if you go to the website, you can see pictures of the tanker and pictures of the delicious, delicious chocolate all over the road. Now, being a person who's done traffic reporting and had to deal with things like cows wandering, wandering on highways and chickens, frozen chickens, frozen pizzas as well, uh, being scattered across the road because of accidents, these things are quite spectacles to behold, but of course, quite a pain to get by. Luckily, this stretch of road wasn't very well traveled at the time, and plus, it was just the timing was, was good enough for that. So it wasn't a big traffic headache, but cleaning up 3,500 gallons of chocolate, that sounds like a headache for someone. We stay in Arizona, but we don't stay on the lighter note. This one, a much more serious, heavier story. Heavier story. The headline for the number seven story is, 14-year-old with airsoft gun shot dead by Tempe, Arizona police officer. Posted on Thursday, January 17th as well. This one, a bump of response from the eight story of 0.95%. A few lines from NBC News' website where we got the copy for the story. A 14-year-old boy holding an airsoft gun was fatally shot by Tempe, Arizona police officer on Tuesday. Officer responded to a call about a suspicious vehicle discovered a person, quote, who was in the process of bur bur burgling the vehicle, unquote, just after 2.30 p.m. Mountain Time, which is 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, on Tuesday, according to a statement from the Tempe Police Department. As officers approached, the suspect ran away holding what they thought was a handgun, the statement said. An officer raced after the suspect, giving, quote, verbal commands, and during the chase, quote, perceived a threat, unquote, and fired his weapon, hitting the teen. 
They did not specify how many shots were fired. Officers called paramedics and performed CPR, but the boy was later pronounced dead in the hospital. Weapon found near the 14-year-old was a replica 1911 model airsoft gun, which police believe was stolen from the car along with other items. The team was not identified by police, but his brother, Jason Gonzalez, told NBC News that his name was Antonio Arce. So, um, yes, that's a story that goes deeper and deeper into that one. But uh, it's these things are really weird. It's hard to get into. And we always give lots of thanks and lots of love to people who work on these level, first responders, police officers there. But we also do see lots of sloppy police work in some cases and sometimes just bad misjudgment in the moment. Uh, we're going to let this one play out. We'll find out more and more about this one throughout the next upcoming weeks, I'm sure. And if it pops up here, we'll definitely let you know. If it doesn't pop up here, we'll keep you in touch somehow on how this story is going. Moving on to a much, much lighter or higher story, if you will. Headline for number six, bill to legalize weed introduced U.S. Congress is numbered 420. Yes, Friday, January the 11th is the date we posted this bump in response of the seven story of 22.01%. A few lines to the story we got from Fox 29 News, and this doesn't say where it's from, but we'll figure it out somewhere. The government is shut down and employees are furloughed, but members of Congress are still working on introducing important laws, one of which is the federal legalization of marijuana, also known as House Resolution 420. In a hat tip to the marijuana culture, Representative Earl Blumhauer, Democrat of, of Oregon, introduced a resolution on Wednesday and the, amid the government shutdown. Of course, by now, you're probably familiar with 120, a special number in marijuana scene. The Oregon Representative Blumhauer's bill is actually titled the Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol Act. That's kind of boring. And would remove cannabis from the Federal Controlled Substances Act. Michigan voters passed a similar law in November that legalizes the possession of 2.5 ounces of marijuana outside the home, plus possession of 10 ounces inside the home. Wow. Residents can also grow up to 12 plants. So there you go. If they pass the bill that will legalize marijuana for the U.S., it will be, as we noted, uh, started off as House Resolution 420. Good one, guys. Maybe those folks up there do have a sense of humor even if they can't get their actual work done. You know how this thing works. It's based on your response to stories, and the stories come as they do. So we go from heartbreaking to heartbreaking very often, and from light to dark and dark to light. We're going to stick on the dark for a couple sessions this time, and we'll just kind of muddle through it. This five story this week is five killed in Afghanistan attack. We pulled this from CNN on Saturday, January the 12th. Bump response of 3.87%. A quick st a bit from the story here and then some updates that we've learned uh, lately in the news that aren't recorded here in the conversation posting. Attackers killed five people at a police station in Harat, Afghanistan on Saturday afternoon, Harat Police Chief Amili Akbabkar told CNN. The victims were three policemen and two civilians, according to a, a, reg a regional hospital in Harat in the far west of the country. Harat Provincial Spokesman Jerry Farhad, I apologize for all that, confirmed that one of the civilians being killed was a child. Further people were wounded in the attack and brought to the hospital. There were no immediate claims of responsibility. Harat Police Chief said security forces killed one of the attackers and were searching for two others. Afghan security forces seized an explosive-laden vehicle that they said attackers brought to the scene. So, We've got a chance to see uh, this over and over again. And there have been more and more attacks throughout the week uh, in general. And a lot of them all have been straight up ISIS claimed, although we know the deal about ISIS being destroyed in the area, at least so per President Trump's um, speaking and many other people saying not quite so. The attacks are basically being bumped up. And we believe uh, this is m speculation from many people that sort of follow this stuff and me on speculation let you know that. Uh, that uh, it's essentially, what, since the United States is saying they're pulling out of the area again, uh, that's when the real trouble happens. They're, they're trying to basically tell us, that's great, why don't you move a little bit faster and we'll help you We'll help you pack or blow up your stuff in the process. These attacks, these attacks are cowardice, we all know that. These attacks are silly to some point, we all know that. But this is the theology of the region and of people, that, that's how they fight. They fight in the shadows. They blow up innocent people. They blow up innocent landmarks. Hopefully we'll find some resolution to this someday. Someday, probably not coming anytime soon, unfortunately. 
We stay with CNN for the next story, and this story is we'll get to more of it and why in the housekeeping segment coming up in a bit. But the headline is, two female rookie police officers have been shot and killed in two days. Technically a super story. As I said, we'll explain that. We posted this on Friday, January the 11th, a bumper response of 3.97 from the number five story. I'll read a few lines from the story we posted from CNN. A female rookie police officer was shot dead Thursday night, the second killed in the last two days in the United States. Davis police officer Natalie Cordorna, 22, was responding to a triple car crash in Northern California City when a gunman on a bicycle shot her multiple times, Davis Police Chief Darren Pytel told reporters. After shooting Corona multiple times, the suspect reloaded the firearm and fired towards a firefighter and a fire truck that were also responding to the traffic collision. Then the suspect fled, Patel said. Her killing occurred a day after Shreveport officer Shateri Payne was shot dead at her home in Louisiana City as she prepared to start her shift. Corona began her service with the department and a community service officer in 2016. She finished the police academy in July and was promoted to police officer upon graduation. She had just completed a, completed a field training and had been out on her own for just a couple of weeks, Patel said. Chief called the officer's death an absolute devastating loss. She was a rising star in the apartment, he, he said. Corona died at the UC Davis Medical Center in nearby Sacramento. In the Louisiana shooting, Shateri Payne was also newly hired, was in uniform and getting ready for work when she was gunned down at a Shreveport home, Police Chief Ben Raymond said. No one has been arrested in the shooting and has not known what led to the killing, Raymond said. Payne was hired in July as an academy cadet and graduated in November. Raymond said her academy classmates grieved over her death. We, of course, had the story on Friday morning of the shooting of the officer in Davis, California. Uh, that, of course, got made the headlines even bigger once we learned about, on a regional level and a larger level, the shooting of the officer in Shreveport. So our hearts, prayers, thoughts go out to the families of both those fine ladies who were just literally trying to do their jobs those days and had their lives taken away from them. We go to the Yahoo News site, which is, yes, still alive and kicking for our source for this story, although it was everywhere pretty much instantly as the news was released. Broadway legend Carol Channing, dead at 97, posted on Tuesday, the 15th of January, bumper response of 51.55% from the four story. I'll give you a few lines that we pulled, although it was essentially from Huffington Post, but the lines we pulled from Yahoo. Actress and singer Carol Channing died early Tuesday at the age of 97 at her home in Rancho Mirage, California. Her longtime publicist, B. Harlan Bowl, confirmed the entertainer's death from natural causes. Whether you knew her from Dolly, Lorelai, Muzzy, or just Carol, Channing was one of a kind talent who captivated any audience. Her razor-sharp wit, gravelly voice, and big smile became the trademark of her performer who originated some of Broadway's most iconic roles throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Channing contributed to share, continued to share her gifts on stage into her late 90s, enshrining her as a class of Broadway's luminaries on her own. Harlan Bowles said, It is with extreme heartache that she, she announced the passing of an original industry pioneer, legend, and icon. So those of you who are a bit younger may not know the impact that Carol Channing had. She essentially was a staple in Broadway, obviously for 40 years, and actually a staple in various roles on television and movies because of her iconic look and iconic voice got her some pretty interesting roles here and there and she was sort of a inside joke in some cases but for people on the inside she was a very beloved person to have around so we of course our thoughts and prayers going out to all of the fans and the family of course of miss carol channing dead at 97 this week a tanker tuck spilling thousands of gallons of chocolate was not the weirdest news story this week that belongs to the number two sport this week, and this is the headline. Costco sells out of 26-pound mac and cheese, cheese tub with 20-year shelf life. Friday, January 11th, was posted. Bump response from the three-story of 4.57%. Yes, a few lines from Fox Business where we pulled our copy for the Costco mac and cheese. Costco's doomsday product line is apparently taken off. Wholesaler made this news this week selling out of its 26-pound bucket of macaroni and cheese that has a shelf life of up to 20 years. The product, according to the company's website, has been on the market for several years, but only recently became out of stock. Under its details, the cheese and pasta are packaged in separate bulk metallite pouches with oxygen absorbers to, quote, protect the quality and ensuring a long shelf life. 
Over the last few years, as reported by Fox Business, Kotsilo has been rolling out several products for doomsday-type scenarios. In March, the company made headlines rolling out three emergency food kits for its website, ranging from $1,000 to $6,000, all of which are designed to feed the family for for a year. The retailer first offered emergency food kits over six years ago. One reviewer who purchased the first version called Thrive for $3,999.99. Three years ago, said her family used their tax return to purchase it. The quote, the food shipped two days after I placed the order and arrived three days after that. Very impressive. All 63 boxes fit nicely under the 15 stairs going to the basement. Make sure you know which boxes contain items for the shorter life, shorter shelf life so you keep them more accessible, the reviewer wrote. So, yes, people love them some mac and cheese. People love mac and cheese with, you know, a 20-year shelf life. And if you're a doomsday prepper, that business apparently is still booming. So, speaking of booming, let's go ahead into the number one story this week. And for this one, spoiler alert, we go down to the other ABC, the Australian Broadcast Network, for something for out of out of there. So, I'm not sure why we're getting so much love out of Australia, but... We love you guys, and I love you so much, I'm not doing a horrible accent. You're, you're welcome with that one. So the details on the story go like this. This story is the number one Facebook story of the week. It gets a bumper response from the two story of just 2.71%, but from the number 10 story, which, of course, was Rand Paul going to Canada to get his surgery, 134%, and for the almost relevant story, 212, that's story 121 or 112, it's a bump response of 8,425%. Let's get you that headline and some details from the story. Carpet python riddled with 500 ticks slinks into pool, quote, to try to drown them. As we said, the Australian Broadcast Network brought us this story. So let's go to the Australian Broadcast Network and read a bit. A carpet python found in a Gold Coast pool with more than 500 ticks attached to his body was trying to drown them. A snake catcher says, Tony Harrison from Gold Coast and Brisbane Snake Catcher was called out to retrieve the reptile from a property at Kulagata. I love saying those things. On Thursday afternoon, Mr. Hansen live streamed the call on his Facebook page, of course, capturing the moment he first spotted the trick riddled snake. What happens is in Mother Nature, animals can live in harmony with parasites, both internal and external. If something happens to them, the parasites get the better of them. He's got hundreds of ticks on him. That's why he's in the water. He's trying to drown them. The quotes from Harrison. The python, which has since been named Nike, was taken to Kirabun, I missed that one, Wildlife Hospital for treatment. It took vets hours to remove and count the 511 ticks. Ms. Harrison hosted another live Facebook video on Friday afternoon to announce Nike was, quote, doing well. There you go. This one was the biggest one of the week on Facebook. Pretty high on, on Twitter as well. And if you go to the website and click on a link for it, you can see the picture of the snake and the ticks. And as a person who's been bitten by ticks uh, quite a few times in his youth, I know well, looking at the little fatty things sitting on you are really disturbing. Looking at the little fatty things sitting on this thing, 511 of them, it's really, really, really disturbing, really weird. And there's other pictures of other snakes on the same page as well. So if you get triggered by snakes, avoid that one. I guess you did the trigger warning before I actually did the story. But I did the story. That one's done. All 10 are done for the top 10 this week. Per se, you. You made it so that a carpet python with 500 ticks was the most important thing to you guys this week. And, well, I can't say much about that, but that's what y'all are into. So how can you determine what's going to be big next week? Hopefully not more snakes. It's very simple. You follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Go to the Twitter and look for us at TH underscore conversation. On Facebook, it is this is the conversation. And make sure you set us so that we are prime in your feed. Don't just set us and then forget us and leave us as so you don't see us. Set us and then make sure we're popping in your feed. Throughout the day, all day long, essentially every 50 minutes, I post a brand new story from somewhere. Sometimes it's newer and breaking news. Sometimes it's stories that take a while to get here. As you know, so social media, things get passed, but sometimes it takes a while for that story to gain momentum and get the massive exposure. 
you see the story, you like it, you love it, you hate it, you share it, you reply to it, do whatever you want to to engage with the posting on either or both platforms. And at the end of the week, we put them all together and add them up, subtract a couple things, hit a division sign, and bam, we tell you which ones are the top ten for the seven and a half-ish days that we have posting online. On the way, coming up, we will have some explanation, some going deeper into some housekeeping, including how the story on the two officers shot this week, two rookie officers shot, is a super story. Plus, we will have the almost rands running out of the top 15, the almost irrelevant story of the week, and shout outs coming up in just a bit here on the wrap up show from thisisconversation.com with me, Jay Cleveland Payne. This is the wrap up show for the week ending. January the 20th, 2019. It is time. It is time. It is time to up your sock game. And we've got a great deal for you. Partnering up with a great team from a company called Exec Socks. Clothing doesn't necessarily make the man, but exec socks can make that suit pop by putting an extra flair on the accessory that is your feet. Now, everybody is wearing really cool socks these days. They are the rage, and exec socks helps you take care of all the hassle of buying socks if you're not a sock person. Number one, you, they'll send them directly to you. Number two, they'll send you a subscription, so every month they send you new socks. There you go. Number three, they have the most unique and great patterns out there and if they're not unique and great enough for you, you can make your own custom socks just like that. It have the their the material is on par with any other sock maker you can think of. And in fact, you probably don't think of sock makers, which is why a company like Exec Socks is exactly the one that you want them to have in your drawer, your closet, wherever you store your socks. It's subscription based or it's one on one. And like we said, they have great eyes for design and if their eye for design is not great enough for you send them your own design you can send them then they'll send you your own socks just like that a great deal that we have that we're partnering with them by going through our website at this is a conversation slash exec socks spelled e-x-e-c socks this is a conversation.com slash exec socks and click on the link there. Visit our all our sponsors who help keep this thing on the air and going. But we have a great deal and we're very glad for our brand new partnership that we just began with this great company. You'll want to know more about it because you'll want their socks in your drawers. They are exec socks. Celebrate another week in of the conversation and another time for shout outs. Let's start off with the Twitter first. Lee W. Moen, also EC Double, uh, Ryan Fortner, my good friend, and also a usual suspect, AARP Goddess. Uh, Grant Foltz is in there as well, along with Randy, Sch Randy Schillinger and Sandy Peckinpah. Uh, some folks that uh, were kind enough to jump over from another group I'm in. Thank you so much for the love there, uh, as well as Napur and Alicia Rust and a couple other folks as well. Now, let's go into Facebook, where it seems like it's all but some nepotism. Good friends, actual people I know and see every single day, including Kimberly Armstrong Smith, also Antoine Ross, Jack Heinrich, Michaela Ayers, Malonando Slim is in there again as well, uh, Larry Pennington, and Rebecca Davis, who promises that she's going to listen this week. So she, if she listens, she'll know she just got a shout out. Kind of cool that works, don't you think? Let's go ahead and get to some house cleaning very quickly, and then we'll get into the almost relevant story. Now, the house cleaning that we have for this week is the super story that is or isn't. Now, this is what we did for the story that was number four this week. What happened was the story that we posted earlier in the day last Friday on the shooting of the officer in California was also high enough to rank into this week as a number 10 story for the week on its own. Uh, the other story that came in hours later, which also linked us to the officer from from Louisiana as well, uh, as the week went on, they were both very high ranking into the initials. And when it all came down to it, the other story was right outside the 15. So we put the two together and just used one headline. We didn't use two headlines because it was essentially an extension of the one officer being shot turned to two. Uh, it turned into the number four story of the week. So the number 10 story was already there. 
the other story outside of the range, basically, but added together, it bumped things up significantly from 10 to 4. And we had a lot of stories and a lot of numbers this week, so that made a difference. So number two is technically a super story because we did use the response from two stories, but only one headline because it covered both people, the the the, the killing of two female rookie officers within the span of two days. Although the circumstances were quite different, both of them were essentially working or on their way to work when their lives were taken from them. Let's go ahead and get into the almost irrelevant story of the week. As we said, it was a very big week. We basically are overdoing ourselves, and we found a way to automate the system while at the same time still making it a good bit of work. So there is still plenty of curation on the stories, so some things get moved around throughout the day based on how, how things are working. But this is a story that actually I've saw I've seen a few times in a few places, but it was something that popped up in the news on the on the national news. CNN had a uh, had a story on it this morning, so I got popped in there this morning, and I'm glad it did because not because it didn't get a lot of love for the rankings, but it was just basically new enough to be uh, out there and and to talk about here. So let me get to you the actual headline, and then we'll tell you why this is kind of important. Black workers at GM plant where nooses were found alleged racial harassment is ongoing. And the link I pulled it from for some NBC News. Like I said, this is story one, one twelve, one no, two twelve. I'm sorry, two twelve, two one two for the week. So we had that many stories posted when we basically had the cutoff, and this one one of the later postings didn't get a lot of chance to move on up in the numbers. This is a big deal because we've seen bits and pieces of this throughout the week and maybe even longer. Uh, on this story, I've saw I've seen it come across the the headlines, if you will, a few times, and didn't get a chance to put it in there based on other things. But here's a few lines from the story that was posted on the 17th. This was posted late yesterday, but as I said, and I keep saying this, so as far as I, if I sound kind of crazy, it's been something that's been in the news, floating around as a story, a lower level story, all week long. A lawyer for black workers suing General Motors over alleged racial bullying at an Ohio plant where nooses were found two years ago claims the harassment there is ongoing. Quote, the hostile environment has continued and reached a retaliatory level, said Michelle Vogt, a lawyer representing a group of black current, current, black current and former workers at the Lido plant who sued the automaker in 2018. The suit alleged the company failed to take proper corrective action after black employees at the GM powertrain and fabrications plant reported acts of racism, such as hanging nooses and whites only signs in bathrooms. So despite that being this is me talking, despite that also being just kind of really dumb, uh, it does show a backwards movement that we're doing in the United States. And and it's not that I'm naive enough to believe that racism or people believing they are better than other groups is going to disappear completely and there'll be a complete tanning of the world, if you will. But it is one thing to do these things in such a overt and obvious and just, just cruel manner. The The reason why people do things that are wrong is because they think they can either get away with it, no one will figure it out, or when they get caught, no one will do anything about it. And this is essentially what we're looking at here. People thought they could get away with it, and if they did get caught, no one was going to do very much about it. A very sad state of affairs we are in our lives when we should be more progressive in that sense, and that's not how we've turned out. All right, so let's get ready to wrap the whole thing up. We're going to round out the top 15, starting off with the number 11 story for this week, which is headlined, To Catch Predators, Chris Hansen Charged with Bouncing Checks. Wednesday, January the 16th, the date this was posted, uh, Us Magazine's where we got this from. I actually heard the story uh, listening to the Jim Rome show because they opened up a, uh, the show uh, with talking about Chris Hansen. Jim Rome, I'll, I'll, Jim Rome also, although known for his sports stuff, does have some pretty deep takes and a pretty deep detailed take on uh, the, the president's uh, feeding of the Clemson Tigers this week, including the fact that filet of fish should be banned. But let's get to the story here on Chris Hansen. The Catcher Predator host, Chris, Chris Hansen, was arrested and charged on Monday, January 14th, after being accused of issuing bad checks, the Stamford Police Department in Connecticut affirms to us weekly. According to police, the 59-year-old as promotional sales limited owner, Peter Psychopapadas, for 350 ceramic mugs, 288 t-shirts, and 65 vinyl decals to use at marketing events. Hmm. Psychopapadas said the merchandise was delivered in 2017, but Hansen failed to pay the bill of $12,998 and 
and five cents. An arrest affidavit obtained by the advocate claimed that the store received the check for the entire amount, but it bounced. Hansen apologized to Psychopatis and attempted to make a partial payment. By April 2018, the store owner still had not received any money or the money he, so he filed a complaint with police. An investigator reportedly called Hansen, but the TV host never showed up at the police station. The newspaper reported Hansen later promised Psychopatis and that his wife would drop off a check, but she never came either. Yeah, we're just going to move on from that one right there. All right, headline for this story, which, um, I mean, how can you blame the woman? Texas woman banned from Walmart after riding scooter while drinking from Pringles can. Posted on Saturday, January the 12th, something that I know, you know, I've thought of plenty of times. I'm sure you've thought of plenty of times just up and about just doing that whole thing. But here's the story. This is from the AP. It became a pretty big thing once people got wind exactly what happened. Wichita Falls, Texas. Police in northern Texas say a woman has been banned from a local Walmart after she spent several hours driving an electric shopping cart around the store's parking lot while drinking wine from a Pringles can. Please tell the Times Record News that officers responded to a report of a suspicious person around 9 a.m. Friday at a Walmart in Wichita Falls. The city is about 125 miles northwest of Dallas, near the Oklahoma border. Wichita Falls Police Spokesman Jeff Hughes said the woman had reportedly been riding an electric cart around the parking lot for about three hours. Hughes says police eventually found the woman in a nearby restaurant and told her not to return to the store. Police say the woman wasn't arrested and her name was not released. So, despite being a total hero... We may never know exactly what she has done for the world, bringing us this story and this amazing, amazing ability to say, F the man, and I'm riding this cart drinking Pringles or drinking wine out of this Pringles can, whatever. Wakanda is old news now. Going back to Zamunda, back to where my babies, well, that didn't work out as well as I thought it was, but we're going back to Zamunda fairly soon because looks like Eddie Murphy has made it official. And the headline is, Eddie Murphy officially returning for Coming to America 2. The day we posted it was on Saturday, January the 12th. Uh, I think it came out a couple days, the news earlier, and it took a couple days to get it into our actual posting. The f- source we have for this one is a website called Screen Rant, which covers screen stuff. So there you are. But it's essentially a real story on Coming to America 2, and it's going to be done by Paramount, and Eddie Murphy is indeed going to be back in the star, uh, back in the starring role, or a starring role in the sequel. Of course, originally released in 1988, the original Coming to America starred Murphy as the Prince of Zamunda, who came to the States to find a wife while disguised as a commoner. It also had Arsenio Hall t- tagging around and had many roles played by Arsenio and Eddie Murphy. Uh, and one of the, um, what, I, I, it may not be the first uh, edition of things like that because uh, Richard Pryor did a lot of those things as well. Uh, but it was one of the biggest movies at the time where Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall played multiple roles in this movie. Uh, some of them unrecognizable to include the, uh, the Jewish white guy in the barbershop played by Eddie Murphy. Getting the right selfie can be killer. In this case, it really killed a person. The headline for the story in the number 14 slot this week is Texas woman accidentally kills boyfriend while posing for snapshot photo with rifle. Wednesday, January the 16th is a day that we had it posted. A few lines from the Dallas News where we got the source on this one here. An Austin woman was jailed on manslaughter charge after accidentally shooting her boyfriend while posing for a photo, officials said. Autumn Ravine King, 20, was arrested Monday in Flugersville in the December 23rd death of Eric Charles Allen, 26. King told officials she was posing for a Snapchat photo with a rifle aimed directly at Allen, who was about to take the photo. She said she accidentally pulled the trigger, fatally wounding Allen. Now, the obvious joke about always having a great photographer around is is there. And we're going to go past that because there's a pretty serious, tragic, and somewhat stupid story uh, because it involves firearms, which are always dangerous and always assume to be loaded. So please, 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 please be careful with your firearms and assume that it is loaded and always be careful to never ever, ever aim it at a person. In fact, you never aim it at anything unless you plan on, on pulling a trigger and firing at it. But a person in general in jest and posing for Snapchat pictures, no. 
And for the story in the 15th spot this week, I cheated you out of part of the headline. Sometimes I rewrite the headlines because they're a little long, and sometimes they, they make better sense if I can add more details into the headline. But this one was one where I chopped it off and let you kind of go along with it. I will read you the full headline from the posting, the site we got the posting from. This was a big deal, obviously. Uh, the site was actually Hollywood Life, and this is the full headline that was posted on that website. Lady Gaga and Angelina Jolie reportedly in talks to play Cleopatra, and Twitter asks, why not Lapita Nyong'o? Or basically any other person who is having a tan of any sorts. The, the age-old question on who plays Cleopatra and why are they all white ladies is a simple question to answer. Because the white ladies they've chosen were very famous at the time and very glamorous. I mean, Elizabeth Taylor got to play Cleopatra because she was Elizabeth Taylor. That's how it was. But in the new age, a new day, in a place where people are sort of complaining about the uh, whitewashing of of stories and actually getting some some coverage of it and making sure that things are done, people are wondering about the new Cleopatra. Of course, this is all sort of speculation and whether this thing is going to happen or not. But apparently a new Cleopatra is coming. And right now, two of the hottest stars in the business, Lady Gaga, who is a growing star, and of course, Angelina Jolie, who has been uh, established, are apparently up for those roles, but not any of the ones who actually have a bit of a tan. So there you go. That story to 15 on this week. It was posted on Monday, January 14th when we got it in there. And since it's in there and it's in the 15th spot, that means we're done for the week. Much shorter show for the week because we did not have a guest. We reached out to WWE President Vince McMahon, who's a little busy running the WWE and fighting off the competition that's popping in there. So couldn't quite make it in for the call today, but we'll see who we can call next week and try to make that happen. In the meantime, you can make these stories happen in the way they did just now. You tell me where they get ranked throughout the one through this week to 12. You see a story in your social media feeds when our following, and you just react to it. On Twitter, we are TH underscore conversation. On Facebook, we are This is the Conversation. And make sure we are set to be a primary feed in your feed so we're not just hidden out there. And like, love, hate, share, replies, respond to the stories as they come down. And the more engagement they get, the higher they go into the score for each week's countdown. You can email the show and see what's going on there by going to the conversation inbox at gmail.com. Of course, you can email me directly at jclunpain at gmail.com or see my other website and other endeavors at jclunpain.net. Uh, we need you to share this with all the like minded people so we have great conversations with other great folks. So talk about it with friends, enemies, and random strangers. In fact, find any person just walking in the street and grab their phone and subscribe to it, hand it back to them, and they will thank you on the spot. Trust me, it happens every single time. Oh, are you subscribed as well? You need to make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out a single episode as it comes down Friday evenings, Saturday mornings as it works out there. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. It doesn't work without you in the conversation. Next week, we'll come back with another listing of top stories, 1 through 10, 10 through 1, each way they want to talk, to sell that basically you determine via your own hands and not just by whatever Wolf Blitzer wants to talk about. In the wrap-up show from This is the Conversation, I'm Jay Cleveland Payne saying talk to you next week. <laughs>